growing up in a youth group, in a very charismatic youth group, you had an understanding that the male and female relationship was, if you had any kind of intimacy at all, that was sinful. The thought of it was sinful. Any kind of affection, a high five might be pushing the envelope at that point. And then everyone had their proper place, that women were not supposed to speak out. And they maybe my proper place would have been to, to sing and play the piano. And my husband would be the one who would be at the pulpit. And he would be the, the head of the church in such a way that the wife only participated and never had any kind of authority at home. And not only at home, but just in life, that that's the proper place for women. And that the proper place for men is to have complete and sole authority. And the women just went where they were given the authority from the male. But that whole culture, too, of, of this, this purity kind of culture, this culture that said, in order for you to be holy, there can be no kind of desire at all of the flesh. And so this desire of the flesh was really around anything that had to do with the human body. So you can't, you can't wear clothes that look like this. There can be no desire of a hug. You can't even really th think too long about someone being attractive. That's also a sin. So there was a whole lot of fear around uh, the, the a complementarity that exists between the male and the female and any appreciation of the other was, was really kind of shunned. I think growing up in that, that purity culture definitely made you have to focus on, I'm going to keep you at arm's length, but internally no one gets to see what's going on in my mind. So I can tell you, like, there's no, I don't struggle with that. I don't think about so-and-so, and I don't think about anyone's uh, being attractive or, or dwell way too long on the way he looks in his suit or the way she looks in her dress. And so no one ever talked about the interior disposition that's needed for actual holiness and actual purity. It really did have to be focused on something external, which really made it Jansenism, which really made it a hatred of the flesh instead of understanding the fullness of the person. In the Catholic Church, we call it like a, a scrupulosity. But there was growing up, if you at all were, were to think about sinfully, which, you know, that's a, that's a pretty extreme th thought. If you thought for a second, this person is good looking, I would love to go on a date with this person, something like that. There was definitely this feeling of, well, gosh, like now, now I can't do anything. There's no goodness in me if I can't control that. And so I felt like a hypocrite to try to tell anyone that Jesus loves them because who am I to tell them about that? Because I just wanted to go on a date with so-and-so. So there was a whole lot of trying to put you into whatever image that's an impossibility for the person to live in. I think that when you, when you posit the purity culture in that way, that it has to be completely devoid of any kind of bodily understanding, like real human person understanding, that you then give people this archetype that never exists and that's an, it's an impossibility for you to reach it. And the only way that I do it is to become inhuman. And so purity culture left you with something that's devoid of who you are, devoid of any kind of humanity, really. When I came into the church, theology of the body had kind of dissipated a little bit. Like it wasn't like a buzzword anymore, but the buzzword that did come with it was that it's theology of the body is going to be like a sex education course that kind of tells you a little bit about Jesus in, in the sex education course. So when I started to really dive into it, though, and realize, you know, theology of the body is really just Christian anthropology. This is just a Christian understanding of what the human person is. It was completely mind blowing because it wasn't just, hey, this is, it didn't start at the fundamental reality of men and women, but in JP2's thought, it really started at the fundamental reality of the person and then how that's expressed in, in men and women. And for me to even start at the person, there wasn't an immediate differentiation that in and of itself just completely turned my whole thought on its head, the way that I view the world, the way that I view myself, the way that I view relationships in general, male-female relationships, being a parent, all of those things were completely blown out of the water by that. When you try to teach someone something, 
you're never going to give them the rules first. And I think that's something that purity culture did. These are the check marks of what you're allowed to do, what you're not allowed to do. And in Catholic culture, in this understanding of anthropology and theology of the body, he said, no, this is who you are. And to start at the place of, of what you already are and then how that's expressed for your freedom is a completely different conversation than this is the rules and you have to abide by them to be holy. That's probably the basis of all of it is this notion of the innate goodness of the person and growing up. And you even hear it in a lot of, in a lot of the Protestant hymn, uh, songs, like in a lot of the Protestant worship songs, you know, I'm sinful and I am covered in the grace of God. And really what that then tells me is that underneath this grace is someone who's, who's horrible and not worthy. And the Catholic Church turns that on its head and says, no, you're infused by grace. You're infused because of your goodness. You're worthy of these things because you are innately good and nothing takes away or adds to that. You are just good. It's good that you exist. And so to learn that when I became Catholic, and that was much later. It wasn't right when I was converted into Catholicism. It was something that I've learned, and I think I have to relearn all the time, that I'm good. Anyone that's thinking about leaving Christianity because of what they've experienced growing up in that, that purity culture really just has to look at the understanding and the truth that you are good and you're loved. That then this, the things that purity culture kind of outlaid, this do and this don't, weren't just for the sake of themselves. Like there's not a do because you just have to do this. It sounds like a really angry parent that's like, do this. And then you're like, why? And then purity culture is like, just because we said to do it, this is the key to holiness. But in reality, the Catholic Church who upholds the human person as a good in and of themselves, when we say do and don't, it's because we want you to be the fullness of the human person. There's nothing about it that's going to take away. God loves you. That One of the worst phrases growing up was like, um, God, God loves you too much to leave you the way that you are. Truth is, God loves you the way that you are. But because of the being of the human person, we're always called to become even more of who we are. It's not because I'm becoming better. Who you are is actually that same person that was nailed to the cross. Who you are is made in the image of God. And if that's true, then you never stop becoming. It's not because you become better, it's because you become more of who you are. The best you could be, really.